Uh, my name, hi, my name's Warren Davis. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I am uh, best known as the designer and programmer of the original Qbert arcade game, which came out 40 years ago. It's the 40th anniversary, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm sure the little man appreciates it. Um, but yeah, so uh, it was developed from about March of 1982 to, I want to say August, September, then it was tested and tuned, uh, you know, went out in the field and, and then literally rolled off the production lines in October. Um, I'm not sure the exact date, but some people have told me it was October 18th, so it's, we're very close, uh, if that's true. <laughs> and then, um, Anyway, but uh, more, you know, most, most people know me about from Qbert, but uh, I've done other things in my career. I did a Laserdisc game called Us vs. Them that came out right after Qbert. Uh, I also moved to Williams Electronics where I was a programmer on Joust 2. I did a redemption game called Lotto Fun. I was also on the design teams for Terminator 2 Judgment Day and Revolution X uh, and contributed to those uh, games as well. I also developed the digitizing system that was used for all of Williams games with digitized graphics. Oh, thank you, wow, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I've done a lot more in the industry. Uh, uh, you may have seen, if you came by my table, that I have a memoir. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but um, I have written a book which literally a collection of all of my uh, stories in my 14 years making arcade games. Uh, I did go into the home game industry after that for a while, and, uh, but you know, who cares about that? Anyway, uh, so you know, we're, we're here to talk about Qbert, and I thought it'd be nice to take, you know, 40, uh, 40th anniversary, let's take a look back uh, at Qbert throughout the years. Of course, the original arcade version is the one that I worked on with Jeff Lee and Dave Field, the three of us were the core team. Jeff, of course, the graphic artist, Dave did the sounds, we'll talk about them later in detail. Uh, after Qbert uh, uh, was Qbert's Cubes, which is a game I didn't really have anything to do with. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then, of course, all of the ports for uh, home systems came out. Um, and you may remember even things like uh, this uh, handheld uh, thing contraption here uh, from the 80s. The Qbert was everywhere in 1983, it's crazy. Uh, they also, Gottlieb did uh, a pinball game called Qbert's Quest which is pretty rare, and I don't know, uh, have any, has anybody here seen Qbert's Quest? Some people have, yeah. Uh, it's very, very rare, I, I don't see it very often. Oh, and then there's this. Does anybody remember this? It's the Qbert cartoon show, Saturday mornings. Qbert shared uh, a slot with uh, Frogger and Donkey Kong. <clears throat> this was really bizarre because we had no input, and and we would just laugh about this because, because uh, you know they gave him arms, <laughs> they gave him a Letterman jacket. He's in high school, uh, you know. <laughs> Coily is like a delinquent. Uh, it's just like, we were like people used to ask us uh, when you what were you guys smoking when you made this game? <laughs> well, we would say what were those guys smoking when they came up with this cartoon? It's insane. Anyway, um, there was a bit of a lull. Uh, Qbert, nothing happened with Qbert for a while after the 80s. He kind of disappeared. But then back in, in 1992, there was a Qbert 3 for the Super Nintendo, which Jeff Lee actually contributed to with artwork. There was a Game Boy Qbert. Um, and then 1999, uh, Atari uh, came out with this uh, PC version. Now, there's an interesting story here. Um, Gottlieb, uh, as you will hear, closed their doors in about 1984. And the rights to Qbert reverted to their parent company, who was Columbia Pictures. Uh, over the years, Sony, picked, Sony the, the big co corporation, bought Columbia Pictures. So Sony actually had the rights to Qbert. I, I was at a game developers conference in 1990, I want to say seven, I think, around give or take a year. And um, I, went, I, I saw a bunch of people from Sony uh, Computer Interactive, Sony Computer Entertainment. And I said to them, because the retro gaming craze had just started in the mid-90s. People were starting to remember the old games. And I said, why aren't you doing anything with Qbert? And they said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you own the rights to Qbert. 
And they said, we own the rights to Qbert? And so, so they're making phone calls and furiously writing notes down. And then a year later, this, uh, this came out. So uh, I like to, to believe, and I think it's true, that I am the person who told Sony they own the rights to Qbert. Um, uh, and there's another little story about this, which is that uh, I think the following year, like this came out, and I met somebody from Hasbro Interactive, the developers of this game, and I said, oh, it's so great, you got to do something with Qbert. I said, um, you know, I don't know if you're interested, but if you're doing another Qbert, I have some other ideas. And they were like, oh, that's great, we'd love, we love to hear them. I said, all right, well, we'll sit down, we can work out some kind of deal. And they were like, oh, oh, no, no, we, we don't want to pay you. We just want to hear your ideas. So, so that didn't happen. But, um, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, most of the Qberts that have been re-released are just sort of rehashes of the original game, which is a, a, a bit of a shame, I think. Uh, anyway, fast forward to recently, and uh, Qbert has made a little resurgence in the movies. Uh, Wreck-It Ralph up on top, pixels on the bottom. Uh, people are always asking me, How, what do you think about that? And, you know, honestly, when I first saw Wreck-It Ralph, I thought, okay, it's, uh, you know, he's portrayed as homeless, and, <laughs> you know, he's, you know, and I, I was a little insulted, but then I, I kind of realized it's actually bringing the character to a whole new generation that had had forgotten about him or didn't know about him, and there's no such thing as bad publicity. So um, somebody just recently uh, tweeted me a, a question about Pixels. They said, what do you think about Qbert having sex with Josh Gad in Pixels? And I'm still thinking about that one, but um, uh, it, you know, <laughs> no such thing as bad publicity. The, 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 only, the only regret I have about Qbert and his portrayal in these movies is just how flaccid they have made him. You know, now, I know the guy's 40 years old, okay? But please, give him a break, all right? Uh, I'm not expecting him to be, you know, like a 20-year-old, but still, it's a little uh, disconcerting. Anyway, um, there was also this thing called uh, Qbert Rebooted, also, again, with the flaccid nose. Um, in 2018, uh, also, I, and I think I don't have a slide for it, but there, uh, Sony actually came out with a, a phone version you can play on your phones. So, you know, he's still out there, which is just absolutely amazing and phenomenal. Uh, there was, you know, the thing I tell people nowadays is when we made games back then, they were considered disposable entertainment. You know, we made them, we figured six months later, it's on to the next game, and, and these games are forgotten. So the fact that people still remember Qbert is, is an unbelievable uh, joy and a gift, and I, I don't take it lightly. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, you may have seen, here at the show, New Wave Toys. Uh, they have a whole line of miniature arcade games, perfect replicas. Uh, and they came out with Qbert. Uh, the one on the right is uh, actually a perfect copy of the cabinet I have in my house. They call it the Warren Davis edition. I worked with them to get every detail right down to the damage uh, and the stickers I've put on it over the years. Um, and if you don't have one, uh, you know, they've sold out, so they're not really available anymore. But it was just a weird thing. They called me up and said, we'd like to make your cabinet. And I said, why? You know? Uh, but apparently, uh, people like them. So, <laughs> eh, let's see. All right, moving on. Uh, let's talk about the story of Qbert. How did Qbert ever come to be? Uh, the first question is, how do you get a job making video games in 1982? And in my case, the answer was, you answer an ad in the newspaper. For you younger people, the newspaper is a, a paper with news that they used to sell. I can't resist, I'm sorry, but uh, this is the actual ad. So years ago, I hunted down from the archives of the Chicago Tribune the actual ad that I, I responded to. It was December 27th, 1981. I was unemployed at the time. I'd been working as an engineer at Bell Labs. Wasn't happy, quit, started studying improv at Second City. Uh, realized that that's not gonna pay the bills. And then I started looking at the want ads, and uh, I answered the ad, and uh, to my surprise, I, I was hired. This is the actual building where we were at. So Gottlieb, of course, one of the old pinball companies from back and forever, um, they were kind of late jumping in the video game craze, uh, and when they did it, they opened up a video department separate from their pinball department. Uh, this was uh, in Bensonville, Illinois, about eight miles from their main plant in Northlake. 
It, it, so when I came for the interview, this is kind of an interesting story too. Uh, I approached the building and, a, and there was this man sort of standing outside the building and he was a, a large, rotund kind of a guy with a gruff voice. And as I was going in, he said, are you here for an interview? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, eh, watch out for that Waxman guy. He's a real asshole. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. I thought that was an odd thing to say. Uh, but in I went and I took my interview and a middle manager guy showed me around and I met some of the engineers, saw the plant, which was empty. They hadn't started producing their first in-house game yet. Uh, it was still being worked on. Uh, and then the final interview I had was with this vice president of engineering, Ron Waxman, who I'd been warned about. And of course, when I went into the room, I waited for him a little bit and he finally arrived. And of course, it was the guy I'd met outside. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and he sat down you know, across the conference room and said, so what makes you think you can do make video games? And I said, well, I don't know. I've never made one. Said, do you have a computer at home? And this is 1982, this is January of 1982. People didn't have computers at home, really. I said, no, I use them at work. I don't really feel a need for having one at home. And every question, he sort of presupposed that I would give a terrible answer. And at the end of the interview, I was pretty convinced I did not get the job. But uh, I later found out he was just messing with people. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, it was pretty much just, he was a pussycat, and he just messed with people. But uh, he really was a, a wonderful guy, and, and I did get the job, and the, the rest is history. I actually have a, a picture of him here. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah, actually, that's not. That, that is a digital representation of him. But uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, this is my first business card, and you can see that the address there in Bensonville, Illinois. Um, the, the plant was completely empty, as I mentioned, and, and the room, no, wrong way, the room we worked in was a, um, it was a big open area. We didn't even have enough development systems to, for everybody. We had to share development systems. Uh, the game that was being worked on was Reactor, uh, which was uh, invented and created by this man here, Tim Skelly. Tim was hired to be sort of the first you know, the guy, he was a guy with a track record. He was known for things like rip-off, armor attack, uh, star castle. Yeah, he knew, he just had a trick. He, he was the rock star. And he became sort of a de facto, you know, mentor. That wasn't his job, but he just was very generous um, and, and easy to get along with and really uh, unofficial uh, mentor of the department. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, so my first job, of course, I had to learn the ropes. I needed to understand the hardware. I needed to be able to, you know, do learn what the, the system was capable of. So I was put on this game. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of this game. Uh, it was not released back in the day, but Doc Mack at the Galloping Ghost Arcade in uh, Brookfield, Illinois, got together with the original uh, programmer of this game, Tom Malinowski and Jeff Lee, who did the artwork. And they actually found the old ROMs and they released it. It's called, um, they call it Argus. But it actually, uh, it had many names. By the way, uh, so all the people, Jeff Lee, by the way, can't say enough about the talent of Jeff Lee. He's a genius. And he would draw sprites by plopping individual pixels. And of course, he would plan it out on graph paper. So that game, you were a superhero, you were protecting the pedestrians. This was a pedestrian walking down there, but he was modeled on me. So this is actually me, if you can believe that. I, I actually, I used to have an afro. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, Jeff was uh, uh, just very, very talented. Now the name of the game originally was Protector. They put it out on test, it didn't do well. And they thought, all right, well maybe it's the name, we'll give it another name. They called it Video Man. And then they think, you know, uh, maybe you know, it has a trackball, maybe we should use a joystick instead of a trackball. They gave it another name, Guardian. Uh, they just kept changing the names of it. Eventually, they came up with the name Argus. I actually, because I thought it was funny, I just call it Pro Vidguard Argus. That's my, that's my little <laughs> nickname for this game. But uh, like I said, they did actually release it at the Galloping Ghost. You can play it under the name Argus. And by the way, I showed you that picture of Ron Waxman. That's where this came from. For a little brief moment, they played with the idea of changing the, the main character to a comical 
Waxman character, and the game was going to be called Waxman. Um, anyway, it was not released. So, now what? Here, and by the way, I contributed some uh, software to that game. There was some rubble that came off buildings, so I programmed a bulldozer to push it off screen. I programmed a rubble which fell without gravity. It came down at a constant speed, which, as it turned out, led somewhat into Cuber. Um, so how, how did Cuba come about? Well, one day, uh, you know, obviously, um, Providgard Argus was dead, and they said, Warren, make a game. And that's literally all the instruction I got. Well, one day, I'm walking in our big room, and I see one of our programmers, Kanye Yamamoto, uh, is playing with a screen that has this on it. And this was a background, but he wasn't really doing anything. It was just kind of eye candy. And so, um, you know, I looked at it, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Uh, if something, if I carved this into the shape of a pyramid and something fell on the top, it would have one of two ways to bounce, down to the left or down to the right. And I thought, okay, that's interesting, that's binary. And it's also, with seven or eight levels, I can fit a random path in one byte. So, you know, my programmer mind is thinking, okay, let me, uh, I can teach myself some things here. I wanted to teach myself, and you know, because I didn't program the rubble with gravity, so I, I asked Jeff Lee to write me up some balls, and I had a, I had a balls bouncing down the pyramid, and I did this. You know, I don't know how long it took, a few days, a week maybe. And that's it. That was, that was literally as, as much of a game plan as I had. But then people looked at it and they said, hey, this looks pretty cool. Maybe you should do something with that. And, and so I was like, okay, uh, I, I guess I should put a player character in there and try to have him avoid the balls. And so I went to Jeff Lee. Jeff Lee had created all of these characters before I needed them. And I said, do you have characters that I can use? And he was like, yeah, let me put some up. So he put some up on the screen, and there was this one oval guy with the long nose, and I was like, I, let me use that guy. He looks kind of pathetic. <laughs> so that was the reason I chose him. And you know, of course, Jeff designed him to shoot out of his nose. That was the purpose of it. But it's my first game. I'm trying to keep things simple. I was like, not, no shooting, ain't gonna do that. Anyway, so that is, that is exactly how things got started. At that point, everything just happened one step at a time. Every time I added something, I said to myself, what should I do next? Uh, I'd talk it over with Jeff. Jeff was a frequent and, and constant collaborator. We, we worked to get, together well. Uh, and so, you know, every step came one at a time. There was, no, there was never a game plan uh, in the entire development of the game. The thing that changed it, though, from just sort of this exercise and adding elements to a, a real game. So one night, I'm, uh, I'm kind of working, I'm, you know, I've got the guy, he's avoiding the balls and stuff like that. And I, Waxman uh, had a habit of sometimes coming into the sort of the bullpen where we worked late at night, if we were working late, and he would just sit behind us and just watch. And you could hear him breathe, you know? He was always smoking a cigar, too. And he would just be smoking a cigar, <sighs> you know, kind of like Darth Vader. But uh, it, it, he just, out of nowhere, he said, what if the cubes change color when he lands on them? And I was like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I thought that was a great idea. So uh, that's when, for me, it actually sort of became a game because then you had a goal. And everything after that really happened very quickly. It just, it just felt like all of these steps made sense. So we had Coily, we had the Flying Discs, Slick and Sam, Ugg and Wrong, and Ugg and Wrong Way is a little interesting too. Jeff suggested having characters come in on alternate planes of gravity, the other two from the pyramid. And I thought, well, that's, that's a cool idea, but I don't know how to do that. I mean, we... We don't have a floating point processor. We don't have a, tons of memory. We, we, you know, it, I, I've got, and it's not a real 3D system. I'm simulating all of this. Uh, so I said no, I, I nixed it. And then, uh, but it kind of gnawed at me. And, and I kicked it around in my head and I can't remember how long it took. At some point, like the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, I think I, I, think I know how I can do this. And I did, and I implemented it. And that is why there is an UG and Broadway. Um, so notice this. This is uh, the, the difference between the, the, that and the other one's the address. In the middle of the development of Cuber, 
We were moved from Bensonville and merged in with the main plant at North Lake, where all the pinball designers were. Now, we were excited because we really loved the pinball designers. We respected them. And, and I was very excited to meet them. And the first day we got there, all of us video guys suddenly showing up in this new location. There was a whole new area that was made for us. We had cubicles and stuff like that. It was very nice. But like we noticed these guys like giving us the stink eye. You know, all the, all the pinball guys. We were like, oh, we're the pinball guys. And they were like, <laughs> and we didn't understand why. Well, what we didn't know was those pinball guys wanted the opportunity to make video games and Gottlieb did not give it to them. And they didn't do anything to, you know, they didn't arrange a mixer, they didn't do anything, they literally just threw us in there with them. So it was a little dicey at first, but obviously as we got to know each other, everything worked out and uh, they turned out to like us and we liked them. And they were still pissed off about not being able to make video games, but you know, what can we do about that? Anyway, th this is the only picture that I have of myself uh, developing Qbert. And one thing you notice, there's a number of things here that are interesting. This thing behind me uh, was our development system. Called, we called it the Blue Box, because it was a blue box. It was made by Intel. Actually, the technical name for it was the MDS-80. It used an eight inch floppy disk, eight inch square, if you can imagine that. Um, these were replaced shortly after by IBM PCs. Um, same thing, we had a ribbon cable that came out of it. Uh, you can see that here. It would go into our hardware and plug in where the CPU chip is supposed to go. A um, couple of other interesting things here. The pyramid is upside down. Because I was working at this time on uh, the cocktail tables. If you play a, a cocktail table, you have, it's like head to head. So two players, the, the, the screen actually flips vertically. So each person takes their turn. So that's something I was working on there. And the other thing that's sort of interesting here is the joystick uh, was actually mounted on the bottom of a Tupperware bucket, plastic <laughs> bucket. And uh, of course, when it was created, it was mounted up, down, left, right. And of course, as you know, for Qbert, you need to have it go diagonally because the, he's jumping down to the left, down to the right, up to the left, up to the right. He's not going directly up and down. But people kept... Like, if they would come over to play it, they would, they would turn the bucket so it was up, down, left, right, and then, of course, they would die, and they'd be like, hey, this game's not working. I'd be like, well, you got to rotate the bucket. So this threw people. I don't know why. I, it always seemed very obvious to me why it needs to be diagonal, but some people were very thrown by it, and uh, I stuck to my guns, obviously. There was really no choice. Um, here's a picture of Jeff Lee. <laughs> but, of course, that is not actually him. He, he did model for this. This is from... Uh, the uh, flyer for Us Versus Them was a laser, laser disc game I did after Qbert, but uh, that is Jeff Lee. Here's a kind of sort of a real picture. Uh, there he is, taken from a video, uh, behind the scenes video I have, is about two minutes of video. I never show it because it is horribly embarrassing. Um, so why does Qbert talk to me? This? this leads us to the third member of the team, which is Dave Field. Dave was our sound designer. Here's a picture of him looking like he's had one too many at a trade show. Um, I don't think that's an exaggeration. But uh, Dave uh, really was a fantastic uh, compliment to both me and Jeff. Uh, just super smart guy, very you know, imaginative. Um, he had this idea for Qbert that we had a Votrax chip, which is a speech chip. That's the yellow arrow. Uh, it was on our sound board, the same board we use for pinballs. And uh, Dave didn't really like the speech it made because it, it was terrible. It was mon monotonous, robotic. And uh, so he had this great idea. Well, what if I just throw random numbers at it? And that is essentially what he did. Just threw random numbers at it, and that's basically Qbert's speech. Ugin Wrongway also use it. The pitches changed. He had a bunch of other uh, things at his disposal. That's essentially how Qbert's speech is. Um, oh, by the way, people talk about Qbert cursing, you know? Uh, and they ask, does he, does he actually say anything? I mean, he actually does say a couple of things. When you power the machine on, he says, hello, I'm turned on. And uh, after you put your initials in the high score table, he says, bye bye. But that's literally the only thing he says in English. Uh, everything else is random. But that doesn't mean you might not hear him say something. Because it literally is random. If you put the right phonemes together, you've got a word, I mean, I could, you know, any possible word. So 
But uh, there's enough. There's no algorithm to keep him from saying anything. It's literally random. How did Kubert get his name? Oh my God, that's a long story. No, it's it's a funny story. So um, basically, this is code. And one thing you'll notice if you look at the code, I call the game Cubes. I didn't have a name for this character. I didn't have a name for any of the characters. I was just really worried about making a game. I didn't, with, with naming them was something I just didn't even want to think about. Um, so, so uh, it, Coily was called Chaser. The balls were called Bouncers, or you know, or I think Slick and Sam might be called Bouncers. Um, by the way, here's a. Uh, the, the prototype marquee, and the original name of the game was uh, basically thrown out by Howie Rubin, our VP of business development. And Howie, you know, out of the box thinker, he and Ron basically ran the department, Ron Waxman. Um, so Howie's idea was to call the game the swear balloon. And we thought, okay, Howie, that's, that's nuts. Uh, how are people going to you know, talk about it? I mean, how are you gonna create a buzz? And how he said, oh, we'll, they'll find a way. If this game is as good as I think it is, they'll find a way. Of course, we all thought he was crazy and we persuaded him against it. But, but I do have, and I don't know if you, again, if you've been to my table, I have a recreation of this uh, unique prototype poster uh, or marquee. I have a poster uh, at my table, um, or I had, because my table is shut down for the day. <laughs> but I'll have it in the autograph room. Uh, anyway, moving on. So. So some games actually went out on test with this marquee. So there are some original swearing marquees out there. Uh, but again, since Howie eventually saw uh, sense, we figured how are we gonna name him? We have to have a meeting. So we called in you know, a bunch of middle managers. I was there, Jeff was there, the art director of the company was there, Howie and Ron were there. Uh, sitting there for maybe two hours, two and a half hours, just throwing out ideas. We knew that we wanted the name of the character to be the name of the game, but what was that name gonna be? Well, we were frustrated, we had no idea, and two hours went by and we were, everybody just wanted to go home, nothing happened. I guess in frustration, somebody walked up and, and they went up to the whiteboard and they wrote, Hubert! And we all looked at it and we said, oh, why, what's, what's Hubert? That's just he says, look, it's a cute character, it's a cute game, you know, and that's a cute name. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, God. And then somebody went up, and this is where everything turned around. Somebody went up, and they erased the H, and they put a C. And we were like, ooh, hey, now it's got cube in it. Cubert, cubes. And everybody started going, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of cool. And then, and then somebody else went up and they erased the CU and they put a Q dash, and we're all getting excited now, you know? Because I think there was some discussion about, we, oh, what if, what if people pronounce it cupboard? And so that was like this, and then, okay, okay, now it's Q. And then Jeff Lee went up and he changed the dash into an asterisk and everybody just leaps up and we're like, yes, yes, yes. And we hugged each other and we kissed the ground. <laughs> that may be a little exaggeration at the end. Uh, but that really was, that was how he got his name at that, you know, it's just, it was amazing energy at the end of that meeting and we all knew, Qbert was the name. Let's talk about the knocker. The knocker was a great feature. Um, people love the knocker, I love the knocker. The thing is, it's just a solenoid, uh, you send an electrical signal and it knocks the side of the cabinet. They use them in pinball machines all the time. Uh, the problem was, I thought it was a great idea. This was the idea of one of our engineering techs, Rick Ty was his name. And um, I liked it, but I was looking for the sound of a body hitting the bottom of the cabinet, like a thud. So this was like a, like a knock on the door. Like so, and I thought, that's not quite right. So we started experimenting with ways to soften that sound. And we ended up putting a little piece of foam where the knocker, where the piston hits the wood. And it worked. It softened it just a little bit, made it sound a little more like a thud. We were very happy. I was happy. We went to management, told them, hey, we got this cool feature. And they were like, yeah, you know, we got tons of knockers. We can put the knocker in, but to put this foam in, we have to buy the foam, we have to get a person to go in and put it. They thought that was too labor intensive, would add too much of a cost to the game, and they nixed it. So as much as a great feature it is and people love it, uh, I, I'm, I'm cursed with knowing how much better it could have been. Uh, I do encourage people to try to find a way to put something like a foam, piece of foam, 
uh, uh, that'll soften the sound, and I think it's much cooler. Uh, so testing and tuning, um, you know, you don't want to hear about this. It's all boring, you know. But we had to test it, and it was my first game, and so I, I really wasn't very confident in my ability to tune. Um, you know, there were three ways that we would test. One was in-house testing, so people just in the office would play the game. And they would give me their feedback, and I would listen sometimes, and sometimes I would not. Uh, then there was location testing. We'd put the game out in a local arcade. Sometimes, you know, we would learn things from that. I would watch, literally watch people play it. I'd get feeling just from that. And then we also did focus groups. An interesting thing about focus groups is uh, a lot of times what people say betrays their actions. Like, you know, watching them play tells you a lot more than what they say afterwards. Because I would watch people play, and they'd be like Ken Jewett, and you could see they're concentrating, and then, you know, and then afterwards you'd say, how did you like it? And they'd be like, no, you know, that's okay. So anyway, uh, it was just an interesting experience for me. <laughs> um, here's some tech stuff. Uh, I don't know if anybody's like tech, you know, care about tech here. Oh, some people do. All right. Uh, we had an 8088 CPU. It was an Intel processor. Uh, the sprites, the hardware, uh, had a sprite engine. Uh, foreground characters were 16 by 16 pixels. I believe Coily is the only character that's bigger than that. He's two sprites. He's uh, 32 by 16, one on top of the other. The background blocks were all 8 by 8, and they just sat in a grid. The back, you couldn't manipulate. The background was not interactive, although there was a bit uh, that we could send a signal to that would flip the background. And I actually use that um, when Kubert jumps off the pyramid, you'll notice he falls behind it. And that's because I actually switched the background and the foreground in that little moment when he's at the apex of his jump. Um, 64 kilobytes of program memory, that's literally all we had to program in. program in. We programmed in assembler language, which is very close to machine language. And the screen resolution was 256 pixels by 240. Uh, the hardware for Cuba, pretty much the same hardware we used for all of the games, even the Laserdisc games, we just replaced the background with uh, movie footage. Um, so, 1982, the fall of 1982, October is when they start rolling off the production line. In November, we took it to our main show. This is a picture of, uh, you know, Cubert's rolling off the production line. It's like an amazing feeling for me, my first game. Uh, it was just astonishing. I was, I was very uh, proud and excited. Um, so we took it to the uh, big trade show in the fall, it was November of 1982. Turned out to be very well received. Uh, here's a little something I throw in here because I think it's amusing. This is a, uh, a page out of uh, one of the, let's see, December. This is from December 1982, it's a trade magazine, but a blow up of the little center says, Gottlieb's new game is the center of attraction as from left, designer Jun Yum well, he's not the game designer, he's the hardware designer. Uh, Boyd Brown, they did get the president of the company right. Uh, programmers Warren Davis and Howie Rubin, well, that's Howie Rubin, and he's not a programmer, he's the VP of business development, and that's me, so they get everything wrong. So this was, this was basically my introduction, like, do not believe everything you read, because boy, just because it's printed doesn't mean it's right. It's so, it's so wrong. Uh, and then I'm going to go through these quickly because basically it's just you know, a lot of press uh, for the game. Uh, both uh, now this is actually somewhat interesting. Cubert was by all of the people reviewing was picked as the number one game in the show, which was just astonishing. Um, and, and even this I'll downplay a little bit because we did get word after the game was out that some people, just some people, were playing it for hours on a single quarter. That is not what you want to hear. Um, it's okay that some people play, because I think it inspires other people to try to get better at the game. So in hindsight, it probably was a good thing, but I freaked out, because it was my first game, and I'm hearing people are playing it for hours. So uh, I, I thought, you know what, it's too slow. And, and people had always encouraged me throughout the design process to slow it down. Uh, I had it faster, and they said, no, it's too fast, it's too hard, uh, slow it down, too, too easy. Uh, I felt it wasn't challenging enough, so I decided I needed to fix that by making it faster, harder, and more challenging, and so I created Faster, Harder, More Challenging Cuber. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've played this, but um, it, it is available through MAME, and um, 
couple of interesting things here. Uh, this has a 1983 uh, a date because it was basically created right after Cube was released. But it also says Milestar Electronics. So this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, Milestar, Gottlieb uh, was bought, uh, sorry, Columbia Pictures was bought by Coca-Cola. Columbia Pictures owned Gottlieb. Coca-Cola, for some reason, thought, I don't know, the name Gottlieb, it's a family name, it's not owned by the family, whatever, we shouldn't call it Gottlieb anymore, regardless of the history. <clears throat> so they uh, had, you know, they had meetings and stuff, and then they must have paid some consulting firm like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they called us all into a room one day, and they had this big cardboard covered with a sheet. And, uh, you know, they ceremoniously said, hey, we, uh, we have to, we're proud to unveil the new name of our company. And they pulled the sheet down, and it said, Milestar Electronics. And then I said, out loud, as it turns out, I said, does anybody know that that's rat slime spelled backwards? <laughs> 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 and and uh, everybody found that amusing except the president of the company, Roy Brown, who apparently did pay somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars. Anyway, okay. <laughs> here's a little bit of game. If you've never seen uh, Faster, Harder, More Challenging Cubert, here's a little bit of gameplay. You'll notice that sometimes Cubert will change, or Coily, or sorry, yeah, Coily will change to a pattern that Cubert cannot change back. And he has to lead Q Bertha over it <laughs> to get it to change. But anyway, it, it's, uh, I think it's fun. It's, it's, my, it's like the director's cut. It's my Cubert of choice. Uh, and I will say that in the uh, New Wave Toys uh, version of Cubert, uh, you can switch between regular Cubert and faster, harder, more challenging. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go a little faster here. I'm gonna kind of zip through here. The Aftermath, you know, there's not much to say about The Aftermath. There were a lot of articles, it, it popped up, people talked about Hubert in a lot of, you know, mainstream, uh, hey, a lot of mainstream magazines, there were, of course, the computer game magazines, but also things like The New Yorker, and, you know, there's John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, a couple other things. Oh, this is kind of fun. So, Video Games Magazine did an article comparing Cubert and Joust because they were both American made. And that was kind of unusual. A lot of the hits were Japanese. So they were taking pride in that. But the interesting thing is that Gali would not let them use our names. So I was referred to as D. Zyner. Uh, Jeff was referred to as R. Teast. <laughs> And then uh, Dave was Jay Walkman, <laughs> the sound guy. Uh, and, and the irony of this is that uh, Williams let Williams let it, all of their guys be named. John Newcomer, Eugene Jarvis, you know, everybody was named. But Gottlieb was like, no, 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 we don't want their names. So we kind of complained, and uh, ultimately that led to us putting a, uh, a, a basically a credits page in Faster, Harder, More Challenging Cuber. So <laughs> something came out of that. Uh, just say, here's some more stuff. This is the New Yorker magazine talking about Cubert. Uh, Glamour magazine. G Glamour magazine, oh my god. Anyway, uh, there was a high C contest where they gave one away. Now this is also interesting too. This just shows how Gottlieb was really on top of the, the licensing. All of these products, hundreds of products, uh, they really did jump on it and Cubert was in fact everywhere in 1983, um, so good on them. And this is just some of the uh, home versions at the Consumer Electronics Show. This is Cubert's Cubes, which, again, I had nothing to do with Cubert's Cubes. That was Neil Bernstein. Uh, they asked me to do a sequel, and after Faster, Harder, More Challenging Cubert, I was like, I, I don't really want to. I'm, I, I have other ideas I want to pursue. And then Neil came to me and said, you know, I've got an idea for a Cubert game. Do you, do you have mind? And I said, no. So. He made this game, it was actually released. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Um, there was also Cubert's Quest, was the pinball, designed by uh, John Trudeau. Uh, anyway, one thing led to another. This is a whole other story I could talk about, but Gottlieb closed their doors, uh, or Milestar, if you want to call it that, uh, in the end of, at the end of 1984, uh, a victim of the kind of arcade crash that happened for everyone. Um, here's a picture of the three of us, the team. 
Uh, and, and here's another little tidbit. Next week, literally next weekend, the three of us will be together for the first time since this picture was taken, I think. We were together, well, this was taken in 2016. We were also together in 2018. But since then, uh, we've never been together, the three of us in the same physical space. But we will be at the Pinball Expo next weekend. Uh, I will leave you with this, uh, oh no, sorry, before I leave you. Uh, this is my book. And uh, I did run out of them at the show, and if any of you bought it, I thank you so much. Uh, it covers my 14 years in the arcade industry, all the games I worked on, the digitizing stuff, William stuff. Um, it was a labor of love, and uh, if you are at all interested in video game history, I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon, uh, unsigned. Uh, if you want a signed copy, you can get it at my um, website, which I think will come up next after this slide about the New Wave Toys. We talked a little bit about New Wave Toys, but they are here if you want to see a replicate. Um, and then I will leave you with this. <laughs> this horrible, horrible, nightmarish image. I, I, I swear I just found this randomly. Um, but that's some information. If you, want, if you want to connect with me on Facebook, please use that address. You can find me on Twitter. That is my website where you can uh, uh, get an autographed copy of my book. And by the way, I did create a discount code for uh, Portland. So it's PRGE22. If you enter that discount code at my website and you order an autographed copy, it will reduce the price to $25.99 complete. So uh, I recommend it. And we do have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, sir. Uh, I love writing keyboard games because, you know, write a passage when you're growing up trying to be a programmer. Oh, sorry. Can, do you want to step to the mic so everybody can hear? Hi. Thanks for uh, talking. Um, I love writing Qbert clones. It's good fun when you're learning to program. How do you get the, the, arc, the arc of his movement when you have no floating point in your hardware? Uh, so, you know, you have a couple of choices. Um, Basically, uh, to, to, to simulate uh, trigonometry, you probably st you would store tables. You would store uh, like sines and cosines, values and tables, and then you'd have to pull them. So there's, there's no computation, it's pre-stored. Oh, you cheated. You did it all in advance. It's not cheating. <laughs> That's clever. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed <laughs> Hubert as a kid, so I'm curious, would you be willing to share how you made that jump from maybe junior engineer coding up a, you know, a bulldozer pushing stuff to being a lead designer? Well, that, that was my job. I, I mean, I was hired to make games. And the only, the only reason I was helping out the first time was just to sort of learn the ropes. But it was always intended after that. This was a small department. There were maybe, you know, five or six programmers. So, you know, they, they hired everybody to make games. They basically hired all the programmers to be lead designers. That was their, that was my job. Yeah. Hi, uh, we attended a, a Pac-Man creator uh, yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, they talked in length about financial aspect of the game too. Like, uh, what kind of rewards or benefits, if any, uh, did you receive or over the years, any kind of you know, yeah. royalties or anything like that? So. Yeah, none. <laughs> no, okay. All right, wait. No, I'll gladly keep it all. No, I, I, I'll qualify that. Okay. When the game was very successful, they did give me a bonus, which was, you know, it was reasonable for me. You know, I mean, maybe it was a third of my salary at the time, maybe not quite. Um, but they did institute a royalty program after Mach 3. It was not retroactive. So they, but they did say in the meeting when they announced it, they said, so for example, if, uh, if, the, if, the, uh, if the royalty program were in effect when Warren was making Q-Word, <laughs> oh, he would have made $110,000 in royalties. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> Yes. Uh, your cabinet that replicate me to a replica of, have you made that uh, foam modification to it? On the, on the uh, uh, New Wave Toys replicates? Uh, on, on your cabinet. Oh, uh, yes, in my cabinet at home? You have I absolutely did. Awesome. Uh, I absolutely did. I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I practice what I preach. So this is a stupid question about my uh, favorite Laserdisc game, Us versus Them. There are no stupid questions, just stupid answers. Did that one guy ever get out of that dang forest? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the answer, yes. Okay. Everybody got home safely. Except the guy who died. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> Everybody dies eventually, come on. 
So, uh, just a question. So, you briefly had a slide for the mellow yellow Qbert. Uh, did you have anything to do with that design? Because I know they added like intermission screens and some slurping sound yeah. effects and like an animation. Yes, Jeff and I worked on that together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We 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 were the only ones who touched the code of Qbert. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Uh, I, the counter says zero just now. So, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the rest of the show. And Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And to the right are the playlist of the Portland Retro 2022 and some other interesting videos. Thank you.